When we first tested the Apple Silicon Max a year ago, we were hugely impressed. Apple has really turned mobile computing on its head and it's completely changed our performance expectations. But as with any first generation product, there's bound to be some snagging points. And in fairness, some of these have been fixed, but others still linger on. And in this video, I want to talk about USB and Bluetooth performance. USB speeds for most external SSD drives, uh, like these uh, Samsung models, have remained slower on Apple Silicon than equivalent Intel machines, uh, by some margin in fact. And Bluetooth interference has been a problem for some users. So now that we've got the new M1 Pro and M1 Max chips, not to mention the new notebook designs, uh, has this changed things? Let's take a look. Uh, so what I've got here is uh, two Samsung external SSD drives. I've got a T5 here and a T7. Both are one terabyte capacity and both feature the same high speed 10 gigabit USB connection. And I'm going to test these on a Windows laptop and an Intel iMac to first establish our expected performance. And then we're going to run them on the Mac Mini, which has got the latest developer beta of Monterey installed. And of course, we'll be using our M1 Pro and M1 Max notebooks. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with these particular drives, let me tell you the difference between them. The T5 storage is connected internally via a SATA interface, and that obviously limits the performance. But it also means that it doesn't get hot and it doesn't throttle its performance as a result. Uh, this means you get consistent and reliable speeds from these drives. And I use them a lot in my work. They're plenty quick enough for video editing with 4K B-Raw footage, or photo editing or audio work. This T7 drive is NVMe internally, so that means higher performance. Uh, though of course it will always be limited by the USB bandwidth. But again, that should mean that the temperatures are controlled. I don't have as much personal experience with the T7 drives, but so far I've not noticed this one getting hot or slowing down. Uh, these really are brilliant drives. If you wanna pick some of these up for yourself, uh, I'll put some links in the description. Okay, let's start with the Intel laptop, which I have here. This is my Razorblade Stealth 13 inch, which has got an 11th gen Intel i7 quad core in it. It's the 1165G7 to be specific. And I'm using Blackmagic's disk speed test, and I'm gonna let it run a few times each time we test it, just to get a good idea of the average performance. And starting with that Samsung T5 drive, we're getting 482 megabytes per second on write and 513 on read. And that's pretty much in the ballpark of where I expect this drive to perform. Uh, let's test it on the Intel iMac. The iMac we're using is a 27 inch with the eight core i9. And here we get a score of 478 megabytes per second for write and 516 for read. So pretty much identical to the Windows laptop. And it's exactly what you should expect from a Samsung T5 drive. But now let's throw in our M1 Mac Mini. This is the 16 gigabyte version, and it scores 315 megabytes per second on write and 386 on read. Not exactly impressive compared to what we've just seen. Now what about these new MacBook Pros with the M1 Pro and the M1 Max chips? Well, I tested the M1 Pro in our 16 inch, so that's the 10 core version. But I can tell you now that there's no difference between that and the eight core version. For the T5 drive, we're getting 401 megabytes per second for write and 387 for read. The M1 Max version scores 401 megabytes per second on write and 387 on read. So there is literally no difference between the Pro and the Max chips. But it does seem that USB performance on Apple Silicon has improved with these new chips, but only with the write times on the T5 drive. And we're still lagging behind Intel Macs and PCs here. In fact, I've also done these tests on my uh, AMD workstation and I'm getting top speeds again from that. So this isn't an Intel specific issue. In a previous video, I showed that you could improve the performance on the M1 by connecting the drive through a hub. And when we did that test, we got a write speed of 401 megabytes per second again which is exactly how these new chips are performing. But when it came to read speed, through that hub, we got 444 megabytes per second. So clearly there is still some room for improvement. Before anyone jumps into the comments section to say that this is a power issue, um, it really isn't. I've tested this extensively. Powered hub, unpowered hub, it makes no difference. And I've tried it with different cables, including certified Thunderbolt cables, Apple cables, and these nice Pepper Jobs USB-C cables. Uh, it makes no difference. What I'd like to try now though is connecting a MacBook Pro 14 inch to my Razer Thunderbolt 4 dock just to see if that changes things. So we get it all connected up, plug in the T5 drive and wow, 
Now we're getting some performance from this T5. 468 megabytes per second on write and 528 on read. So if you want to get Intel Mac USB performance from your T5 drive on your Apple Silicon Mac, you need a Thunderbolt dock. Oh, come on, Apple. Before we draw any more conclusions though, let's move on to the T7 drive. And again, we're gonna start with the Windows laptop, which scores 895 megabytes per second on write and 904 on read. And that is really what I'm expecting. So let's cross check this with the Intel iMac. Uh, what we find actually is it's slightly slower on write at 855 megabytes per second, but read speeds are the same at 900. So the T7 is a decent upgrade in performance over the T5. And since it's a different chipset, Will we get this same performance on our M1 Mini? Well, as you can see, it scores 626 megabytes per second on write and 691 on read. And I was expecting that. Lots of people have reported slower performance with the T7 on the M1 Mac. But is there any chance that it's changed with the M1 Pro and Mac's chips? Our M1 Pro managed 762 megabytes per second on write and 725 on read. And the M1 Max, well, that's basically the same within a margin of error, 755 on write and 731 for read. So again, we are seeing a definite improvement with these new chips, uh, but I guess for completeness, we'd better try it through the Thunderbolt dock. And what we find is bizarrely, we're getting 680 megabytes per second on write and 677 on read. Uh, I mean, what? So if you want to get Intel Mac USB performance from your T7 drive on your Apple Silicon Mac, you definitely shouldn't use a Thunderbolt dock. Uh, what's going on here? I think the Apple Silicon hardware is capable of delivering the performance and that really just leaves driver issues. We have also seen different performance levels with different USB chipsets, which again would indicate that this is a driver issue. Will Apple ever completely sort this out? I am grateful that things have improved, and if I'm honest, it's improved enough that it doesn't make a huge difference to my workflow, but that really doesn't excuse this. Apple should be very focused on the areas where their silicon falls behind older Intel Macs, uh, but maybe this is something that we have to live with and it'll get sorted with the M2 generation. I really hope that's not the case. Uh, let me know what you think about this in the comments section. But now let's move on to Bluetooth. It's much harder to test this because the issues with Bluetooth on the M1 are not consistent. Uh, some people report having big issues, but others are saying that they don't have any problems at all. Is it possible that Apple is sourcing chips from different vendors and that explains this difference in results? Uh, maybe, but I think this has probably got more to do with interference. The only time that I've seen Bluetooth issues with my M1 Mini is when there are USB 3 devices nearby. The reason for this is that cables emit radio frequencies. And in the case of USB 3, some of those frequencies that are emitted sit in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And that's the spectrum that's used for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. This radio interference can be very frustrating. It causes dropouts in connections. The Apple Magic Keyboard and Mouse, which are very low power, are very susceptible to this. So you can end up with lagging key presses and trackpads and mice not working very well at all. This issue isn't limited to the M1. In our studio, we've got a Lacey Thunderbolt direct attach storage device, which has a built-in USB hub. And when we plugged it into the Intel iMac we used for these tests today, we find that the trackpad and mouse lag terribly. Uh, move it a bit further away and there's no problem. There's obviously a big challenge to overcome with shielding here. You want your Mac to be capable of working in that 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So it's no good trying to block that. With Wi-Fi, of course, you can switch it over to five gigahertz if your access point supports that, but there's no way to switch the Bluetooth frequency. What about these new MacBook Pro designs? I've not had any issues arise in my testing so far. In fact, I've been really impressed with the performance. I popped in my NeoBuds Pro and I listened to music for a couple of hours. I tried walking around my house a bit without uh, moving the MacBook. In fact, I left it in my lounge and I was still able to listen in my kitchen, which is through two walls and it's more than 10 meters away. Now, while I'm talking about the NeoBuds Pro, um, Edifier sent these over to me to try out with the new MacBook Pros and they have completely exceeded my expectations. Uh, I just wanna show you this unboxing experience. I really like it when brands get packaging right and Edifier have absolutely nailed the packaging here. It feels really premium. 
And I absolutely love the Knight Rider style LED on the charging case too, that's an immediate win in my book. I find that the audio quality is really good for this price point, and these are the most comfortable wireless earbuds that I've worn to date. In fact, they're so comfortable I've actually given my Sony WF-1000s uh, to my wife because I find the Neobuds are more comfortable for my ears. Of course, in truth, the sound quality and noise cancellation isn't quite on par with the Sony's, but these things cost significantly less money. There are some great deals on Amazon at the moment, so I've popped some links in the description. Uh, so Bluetooth performance is good for me so far, but I will keep testing, and if I do find anything new, I'll report back and make a new video. Now, as you'll have noticed in this uh, video, I do now have an M1 Max model with 32 gigs of RAM and the 24 core GPU. So I'll be doing a video imminently to show the performance compared to the other models. And there are some interesting differences. Uh, in particular, I've been astonished with the testing that I've done in DaVinci Resolve so far. But I won't give away anything yet. Our fully loaded M1 Max model with 64 gigs of RAM and the 32 core GPU has now shipped. So within the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing our big showdown video editing test. This is gonna be huge. We'll include that Windows laptop that we've used today, the Intel iMac. We'll throw in the Intel 16 inch MacBook Pro and four different M1 Pro and Max machines. And just for fun, I'll be putting my Threadripper Pro workstation in the mix as well. It's going to be interesting. If you want to see that, well, please support the channel with just one click of that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the bell so that you don't miss a thing. I want to just say thanks in advance for sharing this video on your social media or with anybody you think will enjoy it. And thanks, of course, for all of your likes, all your dislikes, and all of your comments. I look forward to chatting with you, and I'll see you again soon for some more geekery.